Ibiza is an island of contrast. From day to night. Ibiza is possibly the most competitive place in the world. You can't skip a beat because we have got 100 days to make one year's money. With the challenges it faces on land and at sea. 35% of Posidonia that has disappeared. It's a lot. It takes hundreds of years to recover. As well as the growing inequalities between the mega wealthy and the working class that come to visit this island. The scene's been very squared. It's weird that no one's ever kind of come from our backgrounds to kind of do similar stuff. For five months, every summer, over four million people flood to Ibiza to take their slice of this tiny island. But 30 years since it became a tourist hotspot, I want to know how can we begin to redress the balance in Ibiza? And more importantly, for how much longer can it cope this way? So we wanted to start our journey here in San Antonio. It's probably the most common place that Brits come to stay and to party. But it also comes under quite a bit of criticism for causing trouble and controversy across Ibiza. And San An has undergone a lot of change over the past few years. Nowadays, it's the glamorous Instagrammable beach clubs, the day pool parties and the sunset bars that seem to be thriving. But another area in San Antonio has been hit really hard by regulation and restrictions, just behind us here on San Antonio's West End Strip. A quarter of all the tourists that come to Ibiza are British. Boom! And for all the stick that the West End gets, it's always been somewhere affordable for the younger crowd to go out without having to pay the 60 euro entry prices into the super clubs. The last local government in San Antonio decided to enforce a 3am ban on the Strip, slashing two hours of partying from tourists and businesses. It was supposed to make living conditions for the locals better. And whilst for some this might be true, others tell us it's causing more problems, as thousands flood out onto the streets every night when the bars close. This one road on an island famous for 24-7 partying now has stricter regulations and opening hours than venues in the UK. We've come to Seoul City. It's one of the oldest bars on the West End. 90% of businesses in Ibiza rely on what they call the precious 100 days of summer. And like many of the bars and clubs on this road, the ban has hit them hard. I think to, to, to ask people who are now on holiday in the Med to leave at three o'clock is, is just the wrong thing. People don't come here on holiday to go to bed at 4am. They just don't. They, some of them like to stay up all night and, and watch the sun come up uh, and carry on until they literally see the magical yellow ball in the sky appear. So to ask people to go home at 3am, for me it was just a wrong, wrong thing. People obviously, they are in Ibiza for holiday a few days, so they are not going to go to the hotel at three. So they, they keep asking you, okay, where should I go now? Where should I go now? So they just moving around San Antonio and other areas to Ibiza. Before, all these years ago, I was working normally until five, and now we have to close at three. So this is a big change for me because obviously that affects my salary. It affected our takings a lot. They were the two busy, very power hours for us. We were one of the bars at five o'clock in the morning was still full front to back. How difficult is it to make ends meet when you're essentially earning a salary, your annual salary in five months period? It can be very difficult. Um, I decided two years ago not to take a night off for the summer, so we'll do 150 nights in a row without a day off. But uh, you can't skip a beat because we have got more or less 100 days to make one year's money. 
When we first started, we'd open on the 1st of May, shut on the 31st of October, open at nine, close at six in the morning, because it used to be 6 a.m. a long time ago. Now we open middle of May if we're lucky, probably shut the first week of October, and we trade for four hours now, not nine. There's very little employment. Many people rely on government assistance in the winter. Everyone takes a pay cut. They stop spending money in other places and cut back on other things. So it kind of has a, a, a knock-on effect on the economy where, where we are earning less, so they earn less. The ban was introduced after complaints about noise and drunk people causing trouble in the area. And there seems to be a growing tension. Last year, hundreds of locals took to the streets to protest against what they say has been unlimited, disrespectful and excessive tourism to Ibiza. To put it into context, the Ibiza Preservation Foundation says that for every Ibiza resident, there's 25 tourists. That's the second highest in the whole world. So some of the locals we've spoken to say that they're fed up of how much the island is abused and treated by tourists particularly. How do you think Ibiza can find its balance again? I, I get why people are, are, are upset about what it is, but it, some people have got a very short memory. Some of those people who are retired now, whose children may be saying these words, their parents did very, very well a long time ago with, with, when tourism arrived. Do you think the Strip itself as a kind of hotspot has been targeted unfairly compared to the rest of San Antonio? I do. The reason was we want the people to be able to sleep better at night but no one lives in this street. I think if people are complaining about this just or oh, about fights or duty streets, it's another solution. Not many people are living here. So where was the argument? It's a 150 you know, metre strip here, and if you go 300 metres to the left or to the right, the bars are allowed to stay open. And many people live in those zones as well. Just because we're slightly smaller, than, than the big boys. I don't think it, we should be picked on. And I think, you know, from top to bottom, it's a street that's just, just a fun place to be. Babe, it's not like Ibiza Weekender. But one venue in San Antonio that was born from the Spanish and the British coming together is Cafe Mambo. 25 years on, it remains a strong and iconic venue on the island. I've come to find out why it's still such a big part of the beef and culture in an area that's struggling in part. You were born and raised here and your parents had such a kind of magical moment of kind of coming to the island and really getting something quite exciting started here in San Antonio. So mum and dad, you know, it's the traditional story of a British tourist, they come to Spain, and you know, British tourists go with Spanish man, they fall in love, two Roman, and, and here we are today. So basically, my father and mother created this concept where house music got played. While you read it. While you read it. And so, which now sounds obvious, but that didn't happen back in the day. My dad is a very charming man, and he took care of all the DJs, you know, they came at the beginning. Back then, DJs would be in Ibiza and spend two weeks and they would, you know, hang in the beach at Mambo, order sangria, some food on the beach, and then they say, well, can I play some tunes now? Like, yeah. And that's how it all kind of started. It was like a hangout. And Mambo still remains the hangout it once was. To watch some of the biggest DJs in the world for free, before they go on to play the VIP clubs. All under the glow of one of the best sunsets in the world. What do you think 
is the secret to keeping up in a market that is now being flooded with sunset bars and, and clubs and venues. We would like to think Mambo is a really Ibiza place. It, it represents what Ibiza is and should be, you know. Everyone's welcome. Everyone's to get treated the same, you know. And even if you don't, don't buy a beer at Mambo, you can still have the experience on the rocks. And in, in, in what I say by this, we look after even the people that come to the Rocks because maybe two or three years, when they're a bit older, they can't afford a table at Mambo. We like to believe we're one of the first bars in the world to go the social media way. Already in YouTube days, we went very strong to show the world what we were doing and showing the sunset, showing the DJs. We just love showing the world what we do. And we love reading the comments too. So we do read them, by the way. How people message the people who have been here. It's beautiful. What do you think the challenges of opening a new venue in Ibiza are? I think Ibiza is possibly the most competitive place in the world. We have super creative people come to Ibiza to open venues. We have massive investment companies. We have big hotel company. We have big restaurant chains. And we have plus the local people that have been here forever doing amazing places. So we have all this in Ibiza. So the challenge is huge. Good luck to anyone who wants to come to Ibiza and open a venue. But competitiveness in Ibiza feels more like a modern day issue. It was always known as an island of freedom and inclusivity. This is only the beginning. It became one of the LGBT hotspots of the world and grew famous when it started to play a Balearic version of the house music that was born from working class black communities in the United States. This is only the beginning. But recently, the island has come under criticism for its lack of diversity at the top. Last year, just two of the DJ Mag Top 100 artists were black. But one group of DJs that are looking to redress this balance are Manchester-based trio Mason Collective. They played their Ibiza debuts this summer at Cafe Mambo and the world-famous Amnesia. The boys grew up in Moss Side, Old Trafford and Altrincham in diverse parts of Manchester. They were raised on old soul, R&B and grime, but started to get notice after their underground, intimate and creative house music parties. When we first started, especially when we first started, we weren't kind of liked. It was just like, what are these three dons doing? Like, what, what, are they, what are they up to? Are they going to start telling people how to dress? Are they going to like, do a specific party like this? And it was really bizarre for people to see at first. You don't really see that sort of thing, because... But yeah, we look like three rappers. Yeah, like people, so many people come up to us, like, when we get stopped in the street and get asked for a picture, more so, someone will go, oh, you rappers? Just, like the stereotype of how we look, how we dress, like talking back to obviously like our, our parents era, it was all about the intimacy of like you'd go to the club, you'd always meet new people type yeah. thing. And I feel like that's what we brought back to Manchester, a hub where like, you know, young creatives, um, anyone from that works, you know, in social care or salvages or whatever, do you know what I mean? It's anyone, everyone kind of came together and it was kind of one place where you wouldn't have like egos or anything like that. Spotlight was on us, so when we did go to different cities and things, like even if we just go into parties, just to go and see some DJs play or something like that, we'd still get, we'd start to get people coming up to us asking, oh, are you guys, those guys from Mason Collective, why do you do those parties in Manchester and things like that? Growing up, did you feel like you had role models in the industry? Did you feel like, you know, you were represented? Mm, not, not really. No, no. no. Uh, in terms of the house scene, I feel like in the last 10 years, it's really it's really healthy and great, but we've not necessarily kind of, you know, because house music came from like, you know, the, the, like the blacker, black kind of community in, originally. Like, within the last kind of 10 years or so, it kind of got... A bit stale. A bit stale, yeah. 
people forget that house music was born in working class black communities yeah. in America and especially you know we're on an island here like Ibiza and so many people are getting priced out completely that cannot afford mm -hmm. to come in and kind of access that music nowadays. Yeah yeah, yeah no it's um it's a mad one if you think about it because obviously it's something it's has, a shame, yeah man. it is yeah it's a shame. that's kind of what we've tried to implement into our party is to not price people out to not let anyone who wants to come not be able to come we want everyone who wants to come and dance and have fun to come together it's weird that no one's ever kind of come from us our, our backgrounds to kind of do similar stuff almost because I feel like the scene's been very squared, hasn't it? Paper is just trying to replicate everything we've done in Manchester and tr starting to do in the UK and just trying to take it globally, trying yeah. to take that amazing part Definitely. around the world and show everyone what we're doing. I've got home. to say, only four Manx could sit here in Ibiza as well and bring the rain. Bring so you're yeah, certainly yeah. bringing Manchester. Who <laughs> <laughs> brought Manchester with us? When people think of Ibiza, they always think music and partying, but it's not just the clubs and the constant sunshine that pulls people here. It's got some of the most beautiful, crystal clear coves and beaches, probably in the whole of the Mediterranean. People like to spend their days here swimming and snorkeling and taking pictures in all of this beauty. But so few people realize that that's thanks to something that's over 100,000 years old and it literally helps this island to breathe. So this stuff is called Posidonia. It's a plant that is so crucial to the life of the Mediterranean and the people that live here. But Ibiza has got the worst record for maintaining it. As you can see all along the beach here, the Posidonia is dead that's washed up on shore. Well, many people don't know what Posidonia is and we are amazed because it has a huge importance to protect biodiversity under the sea, but also really as a sink of CO2. That's also very, very important. And I would say maybe the key also is thanks to it, the beautiful, the colors that we have in the sea, the beautiful turquoise water, the sea being so transparent, it's also thanks to it because it's like a filter. So it really purifies the water. So it sounds like it's a really precious part of the pizza. It is, but it is. But what is happening to it? What are the problems? Well, there's two main problems. One is boats, because for years we've had like an increase in the number of boats and the, the, the anchors of these boats really damage Posidonia very, very badly. These huge anchors taking all the Posidonia and it's not a normal plant that can grow in a year. No, it takes hundreds of years. Second part is sewage. So having more and more tourists on the island means that the plants cannot treat the water as well as they should. And so the water that is dumped in the sea is not as clean as it should. And then that is also damaging Posidonia now. Third cause is plastics. So we're having an increase in the number of plastics, which is pollution. And of course, it's bad for animals and for Posidonia as well. And if we carried on as we were right now, at the rate the death of Posidonia is going, what does the future of Ibiza and Formentera look like? Well, in the past, uh, I think it's 10 years, there was 35% of Posidonia that has disappeared. It's a lot. So if we didn't have Posidonia, really the quality of the water wouldn't be the same. And we know that many people that come today would go to other islands or to other places in the Mediterranean. So that's why we think it's an issue that is of big importance to everybody. And more and more businesses are also being engaged in finding solutions. And we've learned an astonishing fact that on this island of constant sunshine, only 0.8% of the homes, businesses and buildings here are using solar energy. But there are some people on the island who are trying to harness this precious natural resource so that the next generations can continue to explore the sea without destroying what's underneath. Welcome on board everybody. We are the only 100% electric, eco-friendly charter company in the Mediterranean. I mean, for us it was very passion-driven. We're sailors, 
and captains and that's how the project started sailing together. Uh, actually this boat was the original, the, it used to have fuel powered engines and then we had one accident um, one time where we were starting the engine and some fuel leaked out and then it makes the multicolored spill in the water and we felt really bad about it. Um, so we just said let's get rid of these engines and, and do it new age style. Step up to the year 2000. And it is quite crazy that for an island that receives 300 days of sunshine a year, there's not more things that are solar powered here. Yeah, well, um, first of all, it's like free. So for, that could be a very big reason to do it. And secondly, of course, you're not contaminating the, the beautiful nature that we are all enjoying here. in your own little way, what solutions do you try and come up with to, to rebalance a beaver? Just talking about our charters, for example, uh, we don't use any plastic on board. All the drinks and the food that we source are locally produced, so there's also no ship, shipping contamination. Obviously we don't contaminate the sea ourselves with the wind and solar energy. And by doing all of that, we are making the people that come on board much more conscious of what they are actually doing if they don't go with us and they go on, a, on another boat trip or doing something else on the island. I think sustainability is really a way of life and, um, and once you kind of adopt that, people, people understand that more when they come on the charter to see the different aspects, if it's the, the clothes that you're wearing, the food that you serve, the technology that you're using. I think obviously education is key because so few people maybe know these things. So is that something you try and incorporate as well into when people come on your boats? Yeah, well, I think uh, I think we mostly believe in uh, leading by example and, and educating by example because you can tell people that that sun cream is bad or um, that using plastic is bad or uh, using fuel is bad. But until you show them the alternative and make them experience that it's as good or even better. Only then you actually um, make the switch in their, in their heads. You know? But I always think we have to see the bottle half full and not half empty because or else we'd just be depressed. So it's like, okay, there are some people that may not understand the issue yet, but we're more and more that understand the importance of changing behavior. So I'm focusing on those. It really does feel like everybody is always trying to define Ibiza as their own. You've got the hippies that see this as one of the most spiritual and magnetic places on the whole of the planet. Then you've got the native Ibithankans that want to protect the heritage by curbing tourism. Then you've got the super rich that come here every summer to sail on their super yachts and party in the VIP clubs. But it really feels as though the challenges for Ibiza aren't going to end soon. We've obviously got Brexit coming that's going to affect tourism across Europe. There's the people that are increasingly getting priced out of here and then there's the pollution that's affecting Ibiza on land and at sea. I really just feel talking to people here on the island now as we're coming to the end of yet another intensive season. People are wondering for how long can this tiny yet precious island carry on this way and for how long is this actually sustainable? Every year there's going to be a new Ibiza. Croatia's now going to be the new Ibiza. But it's a bit like, where's the new Paul Gascoigne in football? There isn't a new Paul Gascoigne. I know this island since I was a baby. I've decided to really put my time and energy to keep as much as we can clean and nice and beautiful for next generation of people to enjoy it. Feels like God put our finger in Ibiza and says, you guys are going to do, going to be beautiful.